the glory. children today has really become more than a notion. They ask such hard questions, especially every February during Black History Month. What do you tell them when they ask you why Africa is called the dark continent and our nation's capital is called the White House? What do I tell them when they ask me, who are we? Are we Negroes? Are we Negroes? Are we colored? Are we black? Are we Afro-Americans? Are we Africans? Or are we Americans? Who are our people? Where is our land? Where is our roots? Why were we brought from Africa to America in the first place? Does that reason still exist? Why are so many of us out of work? Who are our heroes? Did Tarzan really rule Africa? Did Columbus really discover America? In programs to come, we on Captions are going to try to answer some of those questions for you. But because we've had a very rare occasion here in Peoria to experience a Peoria's first, this evening we're going to share with you when the Windy City meets the River City, when the first Lebanese mayor of Peoria lunched with the first black mayor of Chicago, when Peoria's first black city councilman had occasion to share thoughts and ideas with Chicago's first mayor. So what we hope you will do this evening is sit back, enjoy an evening with Mayor Harold Washington and Mayor Jim Maloof. Bright, 
and knowledge world, really, and uh, very willing to be cooperative. Last night, our governor talked about in his state in the state message about a uh, corridors of opportunity, and the opportunity is there. And the key word, the key five letters of the word opportunity are the last five letters which spell unity. Unity, unity within the state, and I'm sure the mayor is going to allude to that. Unity within our own city, within our own county city, and within the other cities within our state. Unity is the key for progress. So those doors, those corridors of opportunity open if we want to open them. We have many great things, of course, in downstate Illinois, but we'll allude to some of those a little bit later too, but you know, Chicago has their bears and Peoria has its Bradley Braves, sir. Bradley Braves. If you don't believe it, ask Viola how we took there to see something that was there. You know, I can't understand Thompson, Governor Thompson doing so much for Chicago. You know, he built the big Taj Mahal up there and all that. And Thompson being a Republican, you know, in Chicago, you go into the voting booth and ask for a Republican ballot, they send you a get well card. <laughs> I don't understand that. The Democrats lay claim to Jesus Christ as being a Democrat. That's a big claim for it, a big thing for them. They say that nowhere in the big Bible does it ever say that Christ came into town riding on an elephant. All right, Democrats, <laughs> mercy. Well, I could talk some more about Ann Bay Stevenson and Thompson, why Ann Bay is running. I understand in Chicago, of course, that they already have the, the winners of the November primary sealed in a big vault up there. <laughs> and one of the reasons Ann Bay is running against Stevenson again is they just found 20 more boxes of uh, ballots all Stevenson's, and, uh, well, anyhow, enough of that. I'm going to get back, don't worry. At our head table, at our head table, we will go at this route first, okay, as the chairman, of course, the chair, chairwoman of the Perry County Board, Betty Menold, and uh, His Excellency here, Sheriff Shadid, Sheriff George Shadid, who is a Democrat. I must tell you quickly about a sheriff. Howard Baker, when he was running for the president, when he declared his candidacy, uh, told his grandmother, who lived to be 102 years old, and by a crazy coincidence, his grandmother was the sheriff of this little county in Tennessee. And so when, when uh, Senator Baker asked his grandmother for her, sort of her approval and so forth, she said, he said, well, she would, you know, she would, uh, she would do it and so forth. And he said, well, gee, thank you. I really appreciate that, Grandma. And his mother come back and she said, well, okay, Howard. She said, look, I'm going to support you. Well, I want to tell you right now, if you really want to go to where the power is, you better run for sheriff. That's a better joke than that, isn't it? <laughs> Two wonderful people have been so instrumental in bringing uh, the mayor to uh, Peoria. This is uh, assistant to the to the mayor, Ms. Jackie Grimshaw, and another assistant to the mayor, Mr. Chuck Kelly. And over on our left, we have Bishop Dawson, who gave us our invocation. And on our left, we have Mr. James Polk, councilman, the first black councilman in the city of Peoria. And then, of course, we have his honor here. And getting down to that, I will now introduce him in the manner in which I was given some lines here. Mayor Washington is a native Illinois. I don't know how many of you knew that. And uh, he's had 16 years. He knows about downstate because he's had, he spent 16 years in Springfield, six terms in the House and one in the Senate. He knows about federal politics because he served two years as a congressman. And since April of 83, he was elected the first black mayor of Chicago, as I said earlier. And although he's a Democrat, Harold Washington has run Chicago in a way that even downstate Republicans can appreciate. Now, you believe that, really. Isn't that great? All right. 
he has eliminated a $100 million deficit inherited from the previous administration. He has eliminated the antiquated patronage system that hired political hacks when it should have hired public servants. Okay, that's, that's good stuff here. Yeah. <laughs> and he is also in many ways drawing hands with other, with a, other localities and other mayors to press the needs of in Illinois and of the Illinois cities. And it is my belief, and truly, truly, I'll say this, because I'm a people kind of a person, and I'm a nut on first impressions. I don't know what you may have heard, what you want to believe. But I think Harold Washington is a tremendously fine public servant. Again, his knowledge, his acumen, his willingness to listen. And we've had some nice visits this morning. And I think we have here now what I believe is going to be the beginning of a long, strong friendship between downstate and Chicago, and certainly between Peoria and Chicago, and that's why we're all here for the most part in the Ch Peoria area, you know, I never talk about that. Let's give a real warm Peoria welcome to Mayor Harold Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Carl Hawkinson, it's good to be here, sir, and Don Saltzman. 
to John Gwynn, my old friend, where is John Gwynn? John, yes. I first, I first met and worked with John back in 19, uh, oh, it had to be in the late 60s, the same time I inherited Parker's. <laughs> same period of time. Uh, that, was, that was up and down of life. <laughs> and I really enjoyed working with, with John Glenn. He's a, a true believer, a man who believes honestly that
interest group, special pleaders, I can't see that to anyone. Uh, Chicago, Peoria, Decatur, New York, Sandy, Springfield, these are not special interest groups. These are the citadels and the uh, preservers and, the, and the, the bastions and protectors of our modern civilization, our modern culture. Chicago, like Peoria, boasts of its uh, health spas, its development in health, its development in, uh, in education, its, its, its tremendous architecture, its fine cuisine, its wonderful hotels, our, our beautiful lakefront, uh, all of the fine arts in abundance that, are, that proliferate, not just in our downtown spas, but in our neighborhoods. These are the things that make life meaningful. These are the net result of man's long travail on this earth trying to acculturate itself. And this is, where this, this is what's in these cities. And this has to be preserved. The cities didn't just fall out of the sky full body to go from the brow of Athena. They were cultivated and developed over a period of years. And anyone who just systematically pulls away the sucker that keeps them alive simply doesn't understand the history of this great nation, how it came into being. So this is what it's all about. And this is why dialogue is important between the various mayors and legislators and Congress people of the state. We must find a common ground so that we can present a solid phalanx in front to whomever doesn't understand what we're trying to say here uh, to you today. And so we're here for that purpose as well. <clears throat> we're also here in a sense uh, looking out for our interests, if you may say so. I understand only this morning that Caterpillar has 1,000 customers in Chicago. Well, that's the volume to be desired. And you can't have not a single one of them aloof, just stay away from them. And they belong to us. <laughs> your, your mayor is a, is a rather aggrandizing kind of a fellow. That means that you better stay out of Chicago. <laughs> Those come in with your pockets zipping up. <laughs> now we're going to watch you. Uh, mayor Maloof is good for us, and he's a he's an upbeat mayor. He's a he doesn't see the downside. He's, he's he's got what it takes. So that's why we're here. Let me just briefly, and I didn't want to get to the downside, but we do have a serious problem. Let me just briefly skirt some of the problems of, of the present federal budget, proposed budget, uh, and, and just the dangers inherent in us accepting that budget without thought. When you talk about dollars, whether they're tax dollars or anyone else, you, and how you, how you spend them, you're talking about making priorities, you're talking about making judgments, and you're talking about goring certain oxes. Obviously, that's what politics is all about. That's what life is all about. The process of dividing the bread and you know that sort of thing. It's tough, it's excruciating. But this is what government is all about. And one has a responsibility when he feels that his particular ox is being gored too heavily to sound off. That's dialogue. That's what makes a democracy work. So without fear of even being remotely considered by the partisan of my approach, let me just say that uh, we're concerned about the federal budget. We want to do something about it. Uh, we in Chicago, as I said before, have something in common with Peoria. We live in cities that grew up dependent on heavy industry, durable goods, whether that be Caterpillar Tractor or the steel industry. Both of us are facing the effect of a national decline in those industries. Employment is down in heavy industry, and we are seeking ways to develop our economies in new methods. In this development, we have been finding creative ways to use federal dollars leverage private funding to create public-private partnerships to bring and keep businesses, to provide small businesses with financial help, to build roads and sewers where they are needed to help business and in whatever way we can to bring jobs, jobs, jobs to our cities so our people can be gainfully employed so they can build their homes, send their children to school, develop their characters, engage in meaningful leisure time activity, preserve the civilization and the culture of which I spoke. That's what we're all about. Only that and nothing more. Now many of these federal dollars are in jeopardy. This will impact heavily upon our two cities, as well as others, as it will on you, our sister city. This is not a reduction of government, it is a setback. Last year, Chicago made use of $9.2 million in urban development action grants. With the elimination of this 
program. Our budget office estimates the loss of 50 other jobs and 50 to 60 million dollars in private funds leverage. Ten to one, you can't get that mailed any place, not even in Las Vegas. Ten to one, let's find odds. For every buck the government puts up, the private sector comes up with 10 and helps us develop our industries. The indirect cost of 1987 to us could be as much as $180 million and 4,500 jobs lost. That's a tremendous crippling figure to impose on a city even as large as Chicago. Take your own city, squeeze the figure slightly, you get the same social fallout and the same economic potential blight. Our community development block grant fund is being cut about one-third in 1986 and it will be cut again in 1987. This combined loss of $56 million will mean the loss of some of our health centers in a city where infant mortality is out of sight and shame, shame, shame on us for letting you get there. Of, uh, we, we have to cut our new, very successful anti-gang program in which within a period of six months last year, we cut down annual homicides by 38, I think the figure is, 28, my conscience, by 28. And we've been playing with this problem for years and years and years. We came up with a community development, uh, community embracing program, and let the communities take over the responsibility with the support of the police, et cetera, et cetera. The whole question of youth gang activity, leisure time activity, training, retraining, and job placement for a very few dollars, about four or five million dollars in terms of the problem. Very successful program of 80,000 home delivered meals to disabled persons, that will be eliminated, and 10,000 medical trips for the elderly will be eliminated if we lose those $56 million. That loss will mean radical cuts in some of our most creative development programs, such as our Chicago Housing Partnership, which combines investment from some of Chicago's major corporations with federal dollars and community expertise. We took $5 million of our community development block grant for and matched them with $10 million from People's Gas and came up with a weatherization program which saved multi-family units, which kept some senior citizens from losing their homes because of the burdening costs of energy. It's amazing what you can do if you have the ingenious people, the will, and a few, relatively few dollars to function. If you don't have the dollars, all else, all else goes a crash. The elimination of general revenue sharing next September will mean that a dozen city departments will lose one-third of their funding there, staff that provides health care to the poor and elderly, emergency food, and shelter to the indigent will have to be laid off, cutting deep into our already straight safety net. Altogether, the city of Chicago is losing $155 million in federal funding this year and stands to lose $268 million 1987, if the domestic cuts proposed uh, by Mr. Reagan go through. And as federal cuts cause our development efforts to slow, this has a ripple effect on our tax base, shrinking our ability to provide essential municipal services, such as police and fire protection. This double whammy is compounded by aspects of the federal tax reform, which places limits on the ability of local governments to use municipal bonds for private development activities. Our ability to join in a development partnership with the private sector will be severely hampered, if not totally truncated. In Chicago as in Peoria, we're trying to move forward. This will set us back. It will set you back. The battle of the budget will also be fought in the state legislature. This is another front where it is imperative that Chicagoans and downstaters, you and I work together so that we do find ourselves competing for the dwelling pools of resources. Last year, we worked with the mayors from around the state to develop a municipal agenda for state legislation. The result was two innovative state programs which we felt would benefit all Illinois cities. These are the Illinois Development Action Grant, which we call IDAG, and the Illinois Housing Opportunity Partnership, which we call IHOP programs which are part of Bill Illinois, the only Bill Illinois programs targeted for cities, only two programs. We are going to
many of you did too, that state growth programs must not forget that cities are the engines of economic development. 11 million Illinois residents live and work in cities. Now that the president is attempting to cut some of the tools that cities use for development, it is especially important that the state help to provide those tools. So one of our key legislative priorities in 1986 will be to earmark as much Bill Illinois funding as possible for local use. Another imperative for economic development is education. It might well be that that's the centerpiece, the focal point, and uh, the end all for any meaningful reform of our spiraling, increasing unemployment, which has inundated certain inner cities and brought about chronic unemployment. State funding of education has dropped during the past six years, even with last year's additional $200 million appropriated by the General Assembly. In 1979, the state paid 43% of the educational bill. In 1985, it paid 39% of that bill. And in 1986, with educational reform, it paid 41% when the Constitution says it shall be the prime provider, I don't know the exact language, of our educational system. The Supreme Court has indicated that 49% would be adequate. We're off the mark, far off the mark. And you in business know that too many of our young people come to you just not prepared to take over some of the jobs that you have and obviously won't be prepared to move into a service economy in future years. Last year in Chicago, we logged 64,000 new jobs, first time in seven or eight years. Many of those jobs cannot be taken by local boys and girls and young men and women because they lack the skills to be able to assume those positions. So it might well be that we're bringing in jobs and bringing in workers, and because of our neglect in the field of education, making flotsam and jetsam out of the residents who live there who can't compete for those jobs. State education funding for handicapped programs, for preschool, for adult education, for vocational education, and for math and science program, each dropped 25% in the last year. That's the future of America. No money is going in to those areas. Education is consequently essential for economic development and job attraction. All this costs money. Some would, uh, could come from redirection of state dollars away from state agencies back to the local level into the key concerns of jobs and schools. Part of it could come from an increase in the local distributive fund formula from one twelfth to perhaps one tenth or even one eighth. Part of it, I submit, must come perhaps from new taxes such as a tax on declining price of gasoline. I meant to cut that out, but I left it in. And now we'll probably start a fight. And we at the local level must also be creative about developing the local partnerships with business and private agencies. And finally, we must work through the legislature to reduce two of the fastest growing drains on our local treasuries, the rising cost of insurance, back-breaking costs of tort judgments. These are programs and problems that uh, we share. We share them also as fellow citizens of Illinois, which ranks 48th in the country in the return of our federal tax dollars. The tax dollars we send to Washington, D.C., return to California, to Arizona, to Texas, in the forms of weapon production and Star Wars experimentation. As urban dwellers, and as Illinoisans, we are seeing a massive transfer of income by way of federal government. Meanwhile, our people become increasingly unable to feed their families and ensure them good education and health care. President Reagan, I said this before and I must repeat it, has declared that cities are special interests that can be ignored totally or neglected. He is wrong. He would be wrong if he were a Democratic president. He would be wrong if he were Abraham Lincoln. He would be wrong if he were George Washington. He's just wrong, wrong, wrong. And there's no point in playing games with him. And I don't want to be cute and call him a Teflon president. I don't want to get into that. All I say is this. The cities of America are in dire need. 
we are to pretend to be a great nation, we must see to those cities with the requisite sucker to make certain that our pride possessions, manpower, woman power, does not drive like raisins in the sun. To not do so is to put this country in peril. I submit to you we can't afford to do that. And Mayor Maloof, I'm here in Springfield today primarily to Peoria today. <laughs> That wasn't no pun, son. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. segment of captions. You know, as we have had an opportunity during the month of February to take a close look at some issues relative to black history, you have a very rare privilege this evening because I have in the studio a gentleman who is in fact a history maker. Congressman Lane Evans has an integral part of what caused us to have a national holiday for one of our true champions, Dr. King, and I'm so glad to have you in the studio. Pleased to be here with you, Michael. Before we get started, just on behalf of the staff and the board of directors at Captions, we want to present you with a commemorative freedom bell that commemorates Dr. Martin Luther King's birth, and certainly hope that you will display that uh, in your office. I'll take it out to Washington where they ne need to hear it ring more than ever. And now with the president proposing some of the cuts he's made, maybe uh, they need to hear it more in Washington than here in Peoria. You're absolutely right. Speaking of President Reagan's message, let me hold it for you. Okay. Uh, as we watched Mayor Washington, he was very specific about some of the implications of the, the Reagan budget message. What is, what is your view, uh, as, as you're there in the capital city, of the implications of the, the Reagan budget on us here in Peoria? Well, if adopted, it's going to hurt all kinds of activities which would offer us the opportunity to get out of the hole that we're presently in. 
uh, it would it would mean in two school years eighty seven million dollars of cuts in primary and secondary education and those cuts would come specifically in certain areas children's nutrition programs vocational education only about fifty percent of our students are actually going on to college so we need those vocational education programs to be strengthened it would be uh, targeted to uh, the handicap programs we'd lose a lot of monies in those specific areas which would really hurt our public schools at a time when our state is doing all it can to actually increase taxes and increase the state's support for our schools and at a time where our cities are losing money because of the unemployment and our counties have lost money because of the farm problems they really can't make up for those losses of revenues so that hurts us with being competitive in what is a more competitive national economy as well as international economy. Our main competitors overseas, Japan, Germany, and some of the others, they put the emphasis on education. I think we're going to get away from that if Reagan's budget is adopted. In addition, some of the economic development activities of our cities are going to be drastically affected. Displaced workers kinds of programs, which allow our workers to be retrained for new jobs, might be totally eliminated and it's just going to devastate our communities even further than they're presently at at this time. You know, we in Peoria have been very fortunate in terms of our use of community block grant funds, of UDAC dollars. I mean, we can look at uh, the Civic Center downtown. We can look at some of the activity here in Southtown. Um, I understand that there'll be some erosion of those dollars. Is that correct? Absolutely. One of the things that's most disturbing, I think, is now that children comprise the largest group of poor people in the country at this time, the most defenseless group of people, the people that need the dollars to develop the job skills and experience and discipline that I think a job brings to a person. If they don't get it at an early age, obviously it makes it harder for them to enter into that job market once they become adults. So we either spend some money to help train and educate the students of this generation. For example, myself, I had the opportunities 10 years ago of going to college and law school. My dad was a city firefighter, but with the GI Bill and with the student loan program, I was able to ultimately become a lawyer and a congressman. I don't think without those kinds of opportunities I would have had the, the chance I wouldn't be a congressman today. Those same opportunities ought to be available for students from all different kinds of income backgrounds, racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, but they're, they're not clearly as these cuts unfold. Uh, those specific uh, lower income people are going to have tough times advancing, and that's what this country is really supposed to be about. You know, certainly as we see the, in my opinion, uh, an increasing gap of, of two Americas, which was once talked about, uh, the potential for that even increasing, i.e. the notion that in addition to hurting poor people nationally, cities specifically, that that much of the program cuts are going to impact the black community even worse. Uh, there's some people who argue with that. Uh, what is your view of, of the notion that we see polls that Reagan's popularity is growing in the black community, but his activity seems to continue to hurt the black community? Why do you assess that? Well, I think probably for the same reason that it hurts our country as a whole and yet people continue to support the, the president very strongly. People like him personally. I don't think they necessarily support his policies and don't connect his policies to his presidency and to him personally. Uh, he's been called the Teflon coated president. He gets away with a lot of things. I, of course, have been one of his biggest opponents in Congress because I think it's not a personality contest. It's a matter of where this country should be going. Making the kinds of right priorities which are going to make our nation excel instead of continue to dwindle. I mean, if you look at it, he's hurt everybody. I'm sure it impacts far worse on poor people, the minority community in general, uh, but uh, he's hurt everybody, really, and yet he continues to be extremely popular. Nothing against the president personally. I've had dinner with him in the White House, uh, and he's from our state originally. It's nothing to do with that. It's, it's a matter of him being wrong as far as so many of his policies are concerned. I guess that one of the things that bothers me is in addition to the obvious social ills that it exacerbates, um, it creates distrust and it widens the gap in the races. Right, absolutely. Why, why should black youth sitting out there today trust a Congressman Evans 
uh, when he and and the president happen to be of the same uh, racial persuasion, uh, but have certainly a different view of life politically. Yeah. One of the things that I think we we're going to have to do better as a community is examine their actions. And in doing that, I promised uh, a couple of young people at the perception that I was going to get you to recollect your experience relative to uh, the Dr. King bill. That to me was just such a momentous occasion and I'm going to ask that you uh, digress for a moment and indulge us on, on that moment. All right. Well, Martin Luther King has been a, a model for me. I was in high school when he died. I followed his career closely in the newspapers and so forth when I was growing up, so he had impact on my life. When I got elected to Congress, I got to a Congress that in the previous session, before I'd been elected, had voted down the birthday legislation by four votes. One of them was my predecessor. So I was pleased uh, that in my very first public speech in Washington wasn't on the floor of the, of the, the Congress. It was before a public rally in support of the birthday legislation. And I spoke there with my colleagues like Ron Dellums and John Conyers. I spoke with uh, Stevie Wonder, as it turns out, and the African Ambassador Corps that was there that day. And we passed that legislation out of the House of Representatives, in fact, by a very wide margin. And I was very pleased with that. Interestingly enough, I was able to monitor the debate in the Senate. Jesse Helms, a very uh, conservative Southern senator, led a filibuster uh, against this legislation uh, because he suggested that Martin Luther King was a communist. And uh, ultimately, that filibuster was broken. The bill was sent to the president. The president signed the bill and at a press conference at the signing was asked by a reporter if he thought Martin Luther King was a communist. And all the president replied was, well, I don't know. We'll have to wait for about 35 years. And talking about some records that the FBI had that were going to be impounded for the next 35 years. I think one of the biggest differences between Ronald Reagan and myself is the way we perceive Dr. King. I don't have to wait any 35 years to know. In fact, all you have to do is go back and listen to some of his speeches 18 to 20 years ago now, uh, and where he talks uh, in his speeches about Jesus Christ and calls himself a reverend. I don't know any communists that do that. So just on that basis of, of perception of, of what Martin Luther King stood for, uh, I think is important. But I think more importantly, any young person should look at a person's voting record. That's the way you really determine where a person is at. In uh, two years in Congress, out of my three years, I've posed Ronald Reagan according to Congressional Quarterly Magazine, more than any other member of the Congress. Uh, my second year in Congress, uh, those three years, I was number 11th. I don't know why I dropped. Again, it's nothing personal against the president. I just uh, think many of his policies are wrong, and I've been there to, to add my voice of protest to many of those specific policies, which hurt all Americans, I think. Black, whites, Hispanic Americans. I'm concerned, for example, about the war in Central America. Uh, that's a widening war. Who's that going to involve? Uh, we know that in Vietnam it was basically poor whites, the poor blacks, the Hispanics that died in that war. That should never happen again. And I'm afraid that we're leading to a wider escalation in that policy. So you said something I think very interesting when we got discussing uh, this earlier on in the show about making history. History isn't just something we study. And when we had this holiday, I was pleased this first time that we had a wide uh, spread turnout at many of these events. We ought to reflect on what Dr. King uh, stood for, but the best way of honoring him is doing something for those that are living today. That's what I've been trying to do as a congressman. That's what I think a, a lot of young people ought to be focusing on. And doing something to honor Dr. King and trying to make history, they'll not only be honoring Dr. King, they'll be doing something for themselves and their communities as well. You know, we, we certainly hear on captions consider you a friend that uh, you know we're glad to have working for us in Congress and we're working for all Americans and I know you have a very busy schedule and take time to come visit with us we certainly appreciate that and we'll look forward to getting you back in here again when you have the time. Michael thank you and thank you specifically for the bell. Sure our pleasure. Thank you. And we're certainly glad to welcome you to Peoria and you also our very special first for us being the first black mayor of Chicago. Would you give a kind of special message to our young people in the captions viewing audience? Oh, I think you, you hit the note when you mentioned Dr. King and black history. Uh, black history is ethnic history. It's everyone's history. 
And I think young people just have to be aware of their history and to appreciate uh, the struggle that brought this country into being and brought them where they are. And I think things like the Dr. King uh, birthday, national holiday that uh, Congressman Lane Evans alluded to is the kind of inspiring thing that might well save a lot of young people from save, so was he just giving up. It's that kind of symbolic inspiration, I think, which is good for, for our kids. Earlier in your message today, you suggested some of the problems the national budget may mean, and certainly part of your target message was the black youth who are going to be touched by some of the cutbacks. What are some of the things that, that the youngster today can do who views politics as something he has very little to do with? I know it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard to get across to, to, to young people particularly, and perhaps even more so to many young black boys and girls, because they feel disenchanted. They feel that they don't belong. They don't feel a part. You see, it all ties into King and black history and all that sort of thing. I think we just have to keep trying. We have to dramatize and illustrate and repeat as best we can to our young people the fact that uh, uh, we are a proud people, we made a tremendous contribution, and they do not have the luxury of not being involved or preparing themselves to the utmost. It's not just training will make your life better. You owe, you owe and you've got to pay. You just don't come into this world and uh, be a drone and eat and sleep and enjoy yourself without putting something back. That's a lesson we just have to teach everybody, black, white, uh, uh, kids all over, time and time again. Sure. And Councilman Polk, our own first here in Peoria, our first black councilman, what would you say to young folk uh, who are certainly concerned in confronting uh, some of the problems that you've had to rise above to become what you've reached today? I think the most important thing is to stay involved and I think they uh, stay in school. I think it's important to, to understand that our future uh, uh, depends on our knowledge and all of the complexity of of society, uh, it's important that we all stay in school and uh, and and dedicate ourselves to the uh, neighborhoods and communities. I think that's one of the, the uh, main thing that we all need to do. I know you all got a lot of people waiting. We'll keep you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good luck to you. <laughs> sure. In the beauty of the lily.
children today has really become more than a notion. They ask such hard questions, especially every February during Black History Month. What do you tell them when they ask you why Africa is called the dark continent and our nation's capital is called the White House? What do I tell them when they ask me, who are we? Are we Negroes? Are we Negroes? Are we colored? Are we black? Are we Afro-Americans? Are we Africans? Or are we Americans? Who are our people? Where is our land? Where is our roots? Why were we brought from Africa to America in the first place? Does that reason still exist? Why are so many of us out of work? Who are our heroes? Did Tarzan really rule Africa? Did Columbus really discover America? In programs to come, we on Captions are going to try to answer some of those questions for you. Thank you.